All right, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on uh, this, the second um, lecture that the Center for Digital Place is arranging this semester. And I'm super happy uh, that we have no, come to <laughs> Dr. Agatha Bashkiewicz mm -hmm. yes. um, <laughs> visiting us. Um, I think one of, the, one of the most exciting things about um, organizing talks is to have the opportunity to see uh, people who do work on the cutting edge of uh, our interests and our fields. And uh, I'm super happy that you could come here and give a talk um, and, and sort of present your work here live, which is always uh, much better than uh, any other thing. You're a great writer, <laughs> but it's always good to discuss uh, the work. Um, so, uh, Agatha is a game scholar whose interests include metafictional and experimental video games, the representation of non-normative non identities in digital games, and the intersection between food and game studies, which is what we are going to be uh, listening about today. And I guess uh, this presentation is related with the book uh, you published in 2022, and the book is called Delicious Pixels, Food in Video Games, and it's highly recommended. So I'm super happy that you accepted our invitation, and I really look forward to it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me here. And uh, is this? Can is I? it not? Oh. It is not moving. So we are the technical Th that's issues the, the, are always the interactive part of it. Yeah. Uh, there it is. And now it should. Okay. Fantastic. Yeah, uh, like you said, that's, um, that the talk is going to be based off of the book and towards the second half I'm going to venture into the ideas I'm working on right now and I'm very, very happy uh, about it because it's the first time that I actually get to talk about um, food since I've been uh, contractually obliged to be talking about metafiction for the last year because of a grant, which is very exciting. I'm very into that topic as well, uh, but it's sometimes nice to talk about something else. So I'm very, very happy to actually uh, be able to, to, to talk to you about food. And uh, yeah, and I like, uh, uh, like for I do have uh, a problem of uh, looking into everything and having always few things that interest me. So one more um, area of interest for me is cozy games and I will get back to that in the second part because cozy games and food in games intermingle very closely and that's also a very fun um, part of this research because I think that's actually what's going to be coming out a lot is that food is in general intersectional and interdisciplinary and it's very difficult to stick just to it. Uh, yeah, so the plan for this talk is to um, do introduction that I done so yay um, I will talk to you a little bit about food studies about critical food studies in general what it is uh, so why do we even study food why do we need it why it's interesting what is happening and all of all of that um, then moving to games what does food do in games which is my starting question of all of it uh, a lot that's gonna be the, the, the short answer um, then we're gonna move inevitably to gender because food is always so heavily gendered that it's again one of the things that make it interesting and and more fun um and then this is the, the last part that i said that it's this thing that i'm writing right now uh working on right now um which is going to go a little more into like questions about what again what the food in games is actually telling us about how we perceive food in in, in this reality um by comparison uh, by comparing the the cozy games and maybe the mainstream games and kind of then bringing it all together uh, on the maybe a little less optimistic thought, but that will be also, you know, not, not that negative as well. Open question at the end. That's, that's, that, that, let's put it like that. Okay, so starting with, in general, what, what is food? I have three quotes that kind of map it out uh, very nicely, uh, starting with uh, Warren Belasco's uh, one of those, you know, when you start writing about something and you find this one quote that has to start every paragraph always, so this is, <laughs> this is the one for me. Food matters. It has weight and it weights us down from uh, coming from the key concepts of food from this bleakest looking cover that you've ever seen uh, as far as books go. But yeah, Warren Velasco, food matters, it has weight and it weights us down. 
from Sarah Seed's very interesting book, if, if food is anything, anything like that interests you outside of, of games, uh, Food Consumption and the Body in, the Compar in Contemporary Women's Fiction. Um, food is a currency or language and eating is an exchange. That is something I will be coming back to a lot, that food is a currency or language or, or means of communication. Um, think about it in terms of, yeah, well, food is everywhere. Um, and we do tend to whew, take it for granted, especially in our part of the world here, right? We come from different backgrounds and, and so on, of course. So we have different relationships personally in our family and society with food, but generally in this part of the world, we do, um, we do take it for granted, right? Food is something that we're going to have, that we're going to eat. Sometimes we eat too much of it. Sometimes it becomes, uh, yeah, and that's, and that's the thing. And sometimes it becomes something else, a substitute for something else, um, which is... Uh, my, my background also is that my MA is in psychology. I'm a psychologist as well and a coach, and I do work with uh, food and, and, and diets and a lot of things that comes out of this part um, of, 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 my, of my work and, and what I see a lot, uh, but also know from my personal experience is that food very often is not about food, right? It is not about just this, this, this meal that we have, but it becomes something else. And when we talk about you know, the, the, the exchange, the, the language, even think about, I don't know, uh, we go to somewhere, we go to see friends with a bottle of wine, or we go to somebody with chocolates because you know we give it to them and that already means something. Or me knowing your favorite food and taking you there uh, when you're feeling, or bringing you to you when you're feeling sad. That already in itself is such a powerful way of uh, conveying meaning or emotions, right? And, and so on. Um, and from Roland Barthes to the death of the outer per person, um, a little longer quote of food is understood here as a system of communication, again, a body of images, a protocol of usages, situations and behavior, which has a constant tendency to, trans to transform itself into situation. I also really like this, this last line. Uh, again, because food will never be just food. And uh, very rarely, um, yeah. It's always something. There's always a situation around food. There is, you know, always a, it, so many traditions, so many ways um, of of looking into that. And it is exactly what critical food studies are doing. Um, critical food studies, as the name suggests, a critical uh, discipline. Uh, it's also very deeply and inherently feminist and intersectional. Uh, created mostly or or, or aroused from um, writings of um, feminist writers. Uh, black uh, Americans, specifically like many good activists or activist movements or, or right or critical or critical theories. This is a lot of work that uh, um, we owe to, to uh, Afro-American writers. Uh, here an example of uh, um, Psyche Williams Forson with the Building House Out of Chicken Legs, Black w uh, Women, Food and Power, very, another very good book. Um, and, and yeah, and what, uh, there are many ways of studying food. This is not the only discipline, but the one in, in humanities um, that thinks about all these things that I started to mention. So who, who is the person who is making food? It, it encourages us to start taking what we take for granted and dig deeper and look into it in more detail. So asking questions, who is usually making food in, in this country, uh, culture, in different cultures? Uh, who, how, and when eats, right? So who, what are the, of course, the ob obvious spoiler here is gonna be that a lot of work uh, falling on the, on, the, on the shoulders of women, a lot of double work coming on, on black women in America, so a lot of, right, black maids, who, uh, I'm not even touching here slavery, right, but like later, a lot of, a lot of women who are doing, working as, as, as maids, as caterers, as, as, as cooks, and so on and so on, being the ones that have to prepare meat, uh, uh, food for, for others, then come home and treat their own family. So there's you know, a lot of this work there. Um, a lot of divisions in the, 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 the hierarchy, in society, a lot of, um, they're gonna be also signified of food, who is allowed to eat what kind of food, a lot of traditions, like in Japan, that if you drink uh, with your superiors, you have to turn away because you cannot, you know, it would be impolite. Otherwise, many, 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 many things like that. And just looking into how it all creates this map of, you know, culture, society, politics, like everything, you, you can find food in all of these um, um, areas of, of, of life. 
Um, so to to demonstrate that a little more um, it, before before I move to move to games, um, I really like this example of how there is a comparison between slow foot movement. There is the Italian uh, started movement that was pr um, promoting that with this very nice and, and, and nice sounding on paper uh, slogan of food should be clean, uh, good, clean and fair. Right. So of course this is. Uh, of course, slow food as um, in just position with, with fast food, right? The better food should be um, good in a meaning of good, good quality, clean, no pesticides, fair, created in a fair environment as in without exploitation and so on. Uh, there are some, you know, more issues with that, with the, the movement. I'm not even, uh, never went extremely deep with it, but just uh, um, to, to compare it with what, uh, Another great paper by Kim Hall, queer crip feminist politics of um, of food. When she kind of takes it apart, um, she comes from disability studies, so she also picks it apart, looking at how privileged is what we talk, uh, what we say about food very often, and how uh, okay, that's great, and it's on the, on the paper a slogan, fantastic, right? But then okay, it's good and it's clean and it's fair, but like fair to whom? And and is it is is you know, the, to, to, to simplify this is the, is the kind of question of, okay, organic food is the best food, we should all eat organic food, but then the prices are three times as, as, as high as, as other food, or maybe it's not uh, available, and, uh, uh, and so on and so on. And uh, Michael Pollan had a book, uh, Food Rules and Eater's Manual. I'm not picking, also from using that, that example from the article, um, not picking up necessarily that, that he did something wrong by he specifically, but more that he's, he, he put this list of, um, yeah, how, how to eat well, how, how are you supposed to be eating, um, and kind of, uh, you know, representing a little bit that movement and, and his rules were like, don't eat anything, your great grandmother wouldn't recognize as food, avoid foods that are pretending to be something they are not, eat foods made from ingredients that you can picture in the raw um, uh, state of growing in nature, don't ingest food made in places where everyone is required to wear a surg surgical cap. Uh, it's not food if it arrived through the window um, of your uh, car. And it's of course all those slogans from like a newspaper <laughs> magazines, right? And like a, a recognizable. Uh, but Han is very, very nicely putting that apart that all of these are slightly <laughs> problematic when you, bless you, when you're, when you're uh, looking into it because of course, you know, reinforcing the stereotype, the, 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 the part about the grandmother, right? That what think about the, the food that your grandmother made, it's actually nostalgia that it, for the time where the grandmother was preparing new food and that puts more stress on, on women labor. And again, that is not necessarily such an easy and obvious thing to think about it in terms of if we didn't have it back then, that it's worse because, of course, you know, medicine and, and other things that kind of nice to have now <laughs> doesn't doesn't even really work like that. Uh, and yeah, and the idea of uh, again disability, so the, the argument that fast food is bad for you, and we of course understand that, and, and yes, it is. But then again, we live in a in, in a world where when you are a disabled person, sometimes you don't have energy to to prepare food, or you may not have. Uh, it's just too expensive, right, to, to do something from scratch, or you just can't because you're disabled, and, you know, cooking a full meal, uh, it's, it's not as easy, again, as we take it for granted, so for many disabled people, fast food is going just to be the food of, you know, of convenience and, and something that they can uh, have, so just saying that as in, you know, putting anything in a bad, good uh, brackets is, is not such a great idea. So these are the things that uh, critical food studies are going to look at, right, uh, and going to think about that. So now moving to, to the main part of, of you know, w what I'm all about. Uh, when we talk about food in video games, um, I will share with you how, how this uh, interest of mine started. I was at a conference listening to a paper on representation of food in hip hop music. Um, and then I started to think such an amazing you know, topic and, and all this, like as in, in a montage, I started to have like all of the game examples that I can think of, of, of food in games, thinking, you know, Mario with the mushrooms and Pac-Man with the, with the cherries. And I was like, that must be something that is like everywhere, right? Well, turned out not, surprisingly, um, not in an academic sense uh, written on it, but there is a lot of food in, in games. But when you say, and maybe you thought, when you say food in video games, and maybe you already thought that, you know, what, what that kind of would be 
uh, we have the, the, the genre of cooking games, right? So that would be like a first thing popping into, into your mind. Except cooking games is such a funny genre. We all know that, you know, genres in general are problematic because nothing is strict anymore. Everything is blurry and everything has three genres and what does it even mean? But uh, cooking game is, is the thing that everyone kind of knows what it is. But when you start defining it, where, where are the lines? What is, what is happening? Usually, of course, it describes the time management game. So the I have a restaurant and I have to you know, work on that or uh, cafes and, and, and stuff like that where you don't really maybe make food, but you have to give it to the, uh, to the clients. Uh, mini games based ones like uh, Cooking Mama, which is you know, the long running series of games uh, of the, uh, from Nintendo where Cooking Mama that, that, that mama uh, is teaching you how to make food and you make it in a mini games uh, step by step and it's actually such an interesting thing also because there is uh, and there's a paper on that that many Japanese teenage girls were picking up who would not be gamers would pick up the game to learn how to cook because it is so detailed and when you do it wrong she gets really upset um, or you know on, or something that I call in the book narrative cook, uh, cooking game uh, which which is more and more popular now. This is a great pizza, a good pizza, great pizza, or either good pizza, great pizza, or great pizza, good pizza. I have it somewhere <laughs> on the slide where basically you have organic customers and you make pizza from the ingredients and, and however they wanted it. And Venpa, which came out last month, I want to say, uh, which is this very short, adorable, very emotional game about um, uh, Venpa being the woman who have has family in Canada, but a, having uh, came there from India and she struggles to um, connect with her child that is Canadian but you know with, 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 the, with the, her, her heritage and she makes food that her mother used to make but the uh, um, recipe cookbook is a little um, blurred out so, so you have this puzzle element you have to figure out how to, how to make them but you have exactly the same situation where you make these recipes and all of the food is based on actual Indian food as well so this is very very interesting. Um, Okay, so when we have food in video games, um, there usually is connect. You can see that it's the, the process around food is uh, divided into these three main parts. Some games are going to focus on one, many are going to have all three, but for example, focus is going to be on a different. So one is collect, uh, collecting ingredients. Um, that's going to be, you know, farming games, right? So you have to grow, or, or games that don't even have later cooking, as far as I know, like Animal Crossing. I don't think that you cook anything, uh, but, you, but you can grow food. That actually brings us to a very interesting question that is something that has been haunting me for a very long time, and I need to write a paper on that, but uh, I will, you know, welcome all of the discussion on that, because I'm very fascinated on the kind of ontology of food, because, again, we know what food is usually, right? But the moment when you stop using food as, as nutrition, is it still food? Because if you're growing tomatoes, and we do recognize tomatoes as food, but there's nothing, no cooking, no eating of it. Is it the plant? Is it the food? What is happening? That is the question that I'm going to keep coming back with these. Uh, second is, uh, oh yeah, or uh, collecting ingredients like don't starve. Also one of my favorite exam examples a survival game where you're thrown into the forest and you have to you know, not starve and not lose your mind and just generally survive. Uh, but there's a lot of collecting ingredients, then you can prepare meals um, and, and eat, quickly eat them. But the, the focus is very clearly on the ingredients, on the collection. Cooking, not as glamorous, doesn't really show you that much how it looks later. Um, and you just consume it and it and does something. Um, yeah, and you have preparation of food, so that's the cooking, the, the, the process of cooking, like the cooking mama and so on. Um, and presentation, that's a game that I literally found for the purposes of this presentation. Uh, I think it has not come out yet, but it's uh, a fantastic example there is about just cooking uh, your grandma's recipes um, to connect with your family during COVID lockdown. And so that's an interesting, an interesting addition. Um, I do write in the book a bit about food porn, so kind of comparing that, you know, the food porn as a as hashtag food porn, as in the, the practice of, of sharing your, your beautiful food on Instagram and, and having that as a means of communicating things about yourself and, and, and communicate and, and, you know, having contact with people. Um, not many games do have that element of 
for example, photographing your food or, or you know, enjoying that. There are some that will show you how, how nicely that looks, like the fin uh, Final Fantasy one that also have a moment that it just looks beautiful. Uh, but not many, that, not, not that many are doing this, so this is interesting. Um, but yeah, but this is also in our reality here, non, in non-game part of our lives, the presentation is also important, right? We're gonna have, of course, like Japan, the presentation being like entirety of a, of a you know, cultural thing. Uh, but even, yeah, the Instagram thing, that very often, you know, think about the, the, the time that you were in a restaurant and you made it just, you know, have even for, you know, to show. I always show my mom, so this is my, uh, I always have to send my mom the, the, the beautiful food. Uh, the other kind of way to look at what the food does is its function. Uh, so, of course, we're going to have narrative. A lot of it is going to be uh, narrative. Um, like, for ex this an example from uh, Far, Far Cry something, one of the Far Crys. Oh, uh, thank you, thank you. Um, I don't write it, I don't remember it. Um, and, of course, there are some other interesting things happening about the dinner, but this like you would think about it in the movies, you, you have a you know moment, there's a dinner, but that also you know establishes the relationship, the character, shows you the power play, and, and so on, right? Uh, word building uh, elements. Um, I was not gonna show you all of the the guessing folks from Dishonored, but Dishonored being a world where everything is dirty, horrible, and unpleasant, but also food is greasy and uh, unappealing and so on, and it's such a nice little thing that kind of you know, immerses you more into that, adds to it. Um, aesthetic version, there's the Final Fantasy, uh, where, yeah, the food is, you know, beautiful, and there's the, the, the food porn part of it. And the ludic part that uh, I'm going to be the most interested in, uh, and, um, uh, yeah, the, like I said, the, the, the first two examples. So, moving to the ludic part. Uh, how, what does, yeah, what does food do in these games? Um, I used the, the typology by Tom, uh, after Tom Taylor, who has a chapter in his new book um, that this book is on animals and the uh, and chapter is on meat. Uh, and then I you know, added my own spin on it. Um, so yeah, so one of the things, of course, is sustenance and restoration as two functions. Um, the difference between them is that sustenance is when there is a separate uh, statistic for, for hunger. So like. Uh, Minecraft, right? Will you have hearts or you have what, the, the drumsticks? Uh, or uh, Don't Starve, that has a separate statistic and there is less, you know, you have to eat to wane off uh, uh, hunger. Restorative is that the one that probably you also fought at some point now during this talk. Uh, this is the, the most uh, kind of common or the, the one that pops to your head first. Uh, that is when you eat and that restores health, right? That's basically the, the, the entire philosophy of it. I will get back to it at the very end. Enhancement is when basically food does um, something for a short period of time that is something extra, um, upsets your stomach, for example. Uh, but usually it's a superpower that it, that it gives you. Uh, so of course the, the Mario mushroom, right? He, Mario eats the mushroom or stomp. Let's say that he eats it, but like, mushroom appears and then he gets gets uh, grows in size or, or, or is immune. Um, the good examples is also Legend of Zelda, where you cook all these amazing, beautiful looking, by the way, um, uh, foods, and then, I don't know, spicy sauteed peppers are giving you resistance to cold or something like that, right? So that would be the enhancement. And this is where I go a little away from, from Tom's uh, um, understanding of that, but there can be food as a resource, that brings us back to my ontological question. What happens with food when it's not being consumed by us? Uh, so in some games, you can use food as something else, to build something, as a ammunition. You know, you throw some uh, the, the tomato at an actor and then, I don't know, it's theoretically. Um, and then it's, you know, ammunition, or you use drumstick instead of eating it to as a, as a club, right? Or a weapon or whatever. Um, also as currency, uh, so when you, I don't know, buy troops in some strategy game with food or something like that. Uh, that's again, the, this inter interesting question of what is really food when you're not eating it comes in handy here and it's interesting in two kind of um, uh, points. One is because it brings us back to question that is also in food studies very important of edible versus inedible. Uh, because, of course, that comes back to, you know, the, the oldest anthropological uh, and ethnographic research of 
okay, edible food is the food that we eat, but I don't know, crickets <laughs> that are being eaten by, by other cultures um, are not food, and it's not, we, we categorize it as inedible, right? Because, because it's, you know, entire colonial uh, um, problem coming up to it. And the second thing, of course, is kind of in the art perspective. So what is the status, ontological status of the of food in still art? Or that banana that was glued to the to, uh, the tape to the wall, right, in the museum and so on. Like it's not because you know the primary function apple. We all yes, this is food, but this is not the primary function of an apple. It did not. It is very human-centered way of looking at things, and that's also nice to kind of step, uh, take a step back, and look at you know kind of not everything. Uh, not, do not look at everything through you know human perspective. And the last one, of personification and of building. Uh, should be two more, but I run out of space. Uh, as in, like two, as two, two separate. But personification uh, when characters are food. So Meat Boy, who is literally a slab of meat, or like an Onion King in Overcooked, and you know, so on, so far. And of course, there are always get, the platformers obligatory have to have like a lay, uh, level that is entirely made of food for no reason, right? Like a Rayman that has everything is candy and he bites through the wall, something like that, right? So so that is um, that is also. Uh, an interesting aspect of that. Oh, I'm sorry, that was also for resource, and that is only on King. Uh, food, yeah. Um, okay, and of course, one more function that is, you know, bringing us back to the, uh, to the, sorry, um, to 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 food is communication. Um, definitely, there is an aspect of immersion in all of that, and just as important of relationship building in general. So immersion I'm saying here because, uh, yeah, because uh, look, think again about those mini games like in, in Cooking Mama, this is a screenshot from uh, Venba, uh, one of the, I don't remember what was that they were making, but do you have to, uh, you have your know, dictionary and you have to kind of together um, figure out what the recipe was to, to you know, to, to do it. And by, by virtue of doing that, you kind of get closer to the character uh, because it's not it's not this is right what games do is you're not just being shown that she cares about this food or that she used to make it but you kind of learn it also how to make it yourself because they are based on real world recipes right you also have this a little bit like if, if you're somebody who who knows how to cook or, or likes to cook you can be now be okay that, that's great now i can now i can try making it you know on my own and and you bring that with uh with you outside in general uh, mini games are very good in my opinion to in um, creating this immersion because you are then maybe not exactly the same way but you're doing the same thing as the character does and there's this moment of kind of bringing you two closer together right if you have to lockpick something and whatever however you do it but you also you know struggle in the same way that the character struggles well they usually just run around while you're lying on the couch and there's this disconnection between you uh, nice uh, really like the example from Pokemon Shield and Sword um, where also cooking is um, less important is the gathering of the ingredients, but you have the cooking uh, as a small mini game that you, you can cook curry, uh, different types of curry, but I think it's always curry. There are three steps to it. Uh, you have to mix it in the sort of like a stir the pot, um, fan the flames, and then put your heart into it, which I really like as a you know very important step of cooking. Um, and I think in a practice you have to like you know press at the moment when it, the circle is in the right. Um, a shape or a size and then it is it is presented so that we also have that element of uh, it is aesthetically pleasing it's nice looking uh, you are kind of proud you know this is or, or this is, you know uh, aesthetically exciting and then both you and the and your Pokemon eat it and if it's good then you both have this moment of, of uh, shared intimacy and friendship and whatever I think if it's bad you just share the moment of disgust but also you share something so that's <laughs> but at least there's that um, yes, all the screenshots of characters are not my own and came from Google, so that's a disclaimer. Um, but yeah, so, so that, 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 that element of, that's actually something that games do a lot with using the ludic part of cooking and preparing food and bringing you closer to it and, and making you feel, you know, very proud of what you've done and, and kind of having you um, share the same feelings with the, with the characters, so that's great. Uh, So yeah, so like I said, uh, not, not, a, not a spoiler, not, not a surprise, food inherently gendered, 
uh, preparation of food is inherently gendered um, because we have kitchen and well, the entire home as a domestic, uh, as a political space, but kitchen very much so. It's interesting also how that is changing now. Uh, I had one of my students point out that when she was, uh, who's a, a chef herself, but that when she was looking now for um, a flat in, in Warsaw, then it is very difficult to find an apartment that has an actual kitchen anymore because the kitchen shrunk in size because, you know, this is not something that is as important, you know, family cooking and so on. There's a lot of takeout and other versions of that. And it's something that stuck with me a lot because it's such an interesting observation. Um, yeah, so women, of course, wield considerable power uh, in all cultures by their control of meal planning and cooking, which of course does not translate into their status necessarily, right? But there is, th there is something. And that creates this, like I said before, that there's always this, um, there are always these hierarchies and there's always this difference between something and something like that is defined by food. So we have the, 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 differentiate, uh, the difference between high class cuisine and low cuisine. We're gonna have the slow food and, and the fast food or, or fast food and you know, gourmet cuisine and all the tiny plates and, and, and the beautiful food and so on, which is supposedly better, right? It is uh, nicer to go to a nice restaurant and, whatever, and the entire thing around it. Um, and it's also something that's been used historically to um, attack the other, as in like other cultures. Uh, you will see that always if there is a group that is ostracized, there's always gonna be a way to come for the, how they eat or their food. There, that is what happens in Venba, and this is also shown that, you know, a lot of, a lot of kids of families um, that immigrate, uh, immigra came to, migrated to the, the States, um, will have that other children are mocking their, 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 their food smells, right? Or, or, or something like this, and they don't want to eat that because coming for somebody's food is the surest way, you know, we, people will mock, I don't know, uh, queer cultures for what they drink and how they drink and then the umbrellas in the, in the whatever, in the, in the drinks and so on. There's always, there will always be the element of food, right? Because it is so tightly connected to the culture and to the identity because of that. So the difference between, between the consumption of labor, who is making, who is, who is eating, uh, provide pr private and public. And that part, the, the, the difference between private and public, becomes very interesting when we talk about cooks and chefs, because uh, both are as words that are describing people who pre prepare food, right? Um, but in stereotypically, stereotypically, the uh, women will be called cooks and men will be chefs, right? Um, and that is also, you know, all of the cooking shows, all of the celebrity chefs, especially that has become visible. Of course, we have, you know, people of, of all genders doing all of the, all of the jobs. Um, but there is this difference between, you know, Martha Stewart cooking from home and being very, you know, homely and, and, and so on. And I don't know, all these traveling chefs, especially, so they go as far from that as possible. Um, and they, it, this idea of, of men having more freedom to pick and choose how to be a foodie is such a nice way of putting it. Uh, because cooking came from, you know, you didn't have, a man who doesn't have to cook for the family uh, and then start doing this as a hobby, as a leisure, right? And, and brings it out. And there's this um, difference in that. And uh, it's also very interesting with how COVID changed that d dynamic. For example, with Jamie Oliver, uh, who started doing the YouTube show, uh, cooking from home, of course, his kitchen is bigger than my home. So <laughs> hashtag relatable content, right? But like, a, but there was a shift of the kind of, originally the cooking shows were always aiming at, uh, at women as a, as a uh, um, uh, stay at home moms and, and, and uh, you know, uh, so on that to, to teach them how to, how to do things. And kind of that vibe, uh, you know, soften up and, and uh, uh, there are interesting papers also on Jamie's kind of more softness in this that, you know, compared to, uh, um, Gordon Ramsay or something like that. Uh, yeah, so so uh, the fact that the chef is the one that's gonna be engaged more, so celebrity chef versus versus like a cook, and that also is visible with uh, cooking and I'm games and I'm using that term very you know broadly, um, although it's of course changing. But so you know we have we have a cooking mama that is of course as you know, far on this side of the spectrum as possible with, with uh, Flo. Um, uh, Shira just had both that in her book and in her article, very interesting, like a kind of discussion of, in general, you know, the casual games, 
it, it's different but, okay. uh, but uh, uh, specifically here like like that uh, genre was you know first uh, more aimed at, at girls and women for for like a more uh, less intense play but that is of course not uh, an old school way of doing it venba that is uh, yeah the kind of new way of doing that because it's more narrative a fantastic game that I will talk more on the next slide the battle chef brigade um, and the example that I have to always put because I freaking love it uh, I love you Colin Sanders which is a dating free dating sim because it is basically advert advertisement where Colin Sanders is the dashing uh, person that you want to romance and the food that he makes is always so amazingly this is the KFC food right by the way like the, the greasy one but it's like beautiful and there is like a secret ingredient and there's magic and there's little hearts and mwah. it's fantastic fantastic example of that and the, I also have that in the chapter on the book because I could not resist um, and the, you know Gordon Ramsay has, has you know made, made its way into all of the media of course but yeah but cooking genre um, has changed obviously and now as I said and you know we all know that genres on games such a difficult thing in general and, and to describe that but uh, yeah so we have Battle Chef Brigade that is I think Canadian game but very heavily as you can see based on uh, anime aesthetics and you have a, a main character who's like of this is Chinese Chinese family but I don't think that they use because it's a fantasy land so I'm not I don't think that this is specified but her uh, style of cooking is definitely she cooks more of the of the you know China based um, uh, and cuisine and each character has their own more specific uh, inspirations for food and she her family has you know a small village small restaurant and so on and she makes it goes to the big city to take part in a chef tournament to be become a official royal guard chef and the game is fantastic because it also does you know cooking completely differently there is uh, there are fighting elements because during the tournaments she has to go and or whoever you're playing has to go and get the ingredients usually through battling monsters to get you know meat from them so you have the battle uh, part and then cooking is basically match three uh, puzzle game which i find fantastic as an idea uh, and also has definitely a lot of emphasis on the, the food is beautiful. It is presented, it looks, it, it, it just, even look at the, you know, on, online on the pictures of it, beautiful food, but the really fun game. And also, of course, puts, gives us the, the female chef. There are also, there is a orc character and I think maybe a zombie one, but who are, who are masculine. Uh, the, the other one might be non-binary, I'm not 100% sure, but, but we have the, the chef and there are chefs not good. Venba, like I said, it is one and a half hour, one hour and a half long game, so highly recommended. Um, very beautiful, very nice, and you can see that there's a lot of personal things and, and emotions that came into that. And then every recipe kind of similar in that sense that both make you follow recipes of either grandmother or her mother. So there is this, this aspect of it, but there is a lot of about connecting uh, to the family. And in the next recipe, like I said, uh, just in general, I think connecting with family and then um, yeah, the, taking the pictures and so on, and here connecting, uh, not wanting to lose your 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 you know uh, home and, and your home culture, and uh, connect to your son who is very Canadian. But what is also very nice to see and very exciting is that uh, you know there is this idea of this traditional culinary masculinity, so normative masculine display of non-femininity and heterosexual desire that can be seen in an approach to cooking as leisure in contrast to more feminine family obligation or as seduction, right? So usually stereotypically men would cook or, or give you food to, you know, charm you and, and you know, this is the Stardew Valley uh, uh, logics, right? And the rules that I give you food and you give me love and that's just how it works. I mean, not, not wrong, but like, yes. <laughs> uh, but we, we are having definitely this moment of soften and, and you know of course the the portrayal of men and masculinities in games still leaving a lot of to desire but there is something about the the, the some softness of the, the soft culinary masculinities if you if you will are uh showing up and of course you know that is very beautifully in shown in in, in zelda at least the, the, the first one i but i think that is similar i was told that this is similar in uh, <laughs> in the new one that picking up the ingredients the cooking is such a nice 
a soft moment of of the dog, he, he he cooks and everything is jumping in that in that pot and there's a nice music and it's like a relaxing cozy moment um, and it's like you know you don't have to yeah basically um, dream daddy the dream dad dating simulator so the dating sim where you are a single father and you're dating other single fathers um, this is I always also have this in the in the book the the example uh, surprisingly a lot of food used to connect to uh, it's not a it's not a game about food. It's not a cooking game. It's not a food is not the the focus. But in all of these that's different stories, food becomes an important way of communicating. They show who they are through food, and you have different you know ways of interacting with them with food, um, and also with the daughter that you bake the sorry you were sad, but I support you one hundred percent cake. Um, uh, even if you know this is like a, the food becomes something that these fathers are you know sometimes they're they're, they're cooking because for, for their children, so they're taking on this this part, uh, not. Everything is perfect about the game, definitely, but this, this aspect is uh, uh, really nice. In Venba, mostly she is cooking, but he is seen cooking with her as well. So there is this aspect of, you know, helping a little bit and, um, and that. And, and of course, uh, Ignis, um, yeah, that's why I have his name on the, on the screenshot, because like I said, I don't write it, I don't remember. Um, who, of course, is doing the, the, the cooking and you're collecting the recipes. And there's also this mini uh, side quest moment when uh, they together, uh, you know, you ask for help to, with, with cooking and there's like this very intimate moment between them. But, but Final Fantasy has been doing a lot of this softness moments and these boys on the road together and there's like kind of this, this camaraderie and so on. And that also is nice to see that cooking, you know, not just something that you'd eat to, 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 to give, to get um, HP, but, but also that. Okay. So a lot of these games are very cute. That's uh, my segue. A lot of these games are really cute, so very cozy. A lot of food, right? The the nanai recipe and 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 uh, good pizza, great pizza. Such a difficult to f remember title for me. Um, they all are venturing into the cozy games. A lot of them, um, and the cozy games are the games that came out as an answer to very difficult or stressful high tension games they are games that are uh, yeah safe uh, they have abundance of resources and i will get to abundance in a second and are soft in a sense of how they look they are pretty they are they have uh, toned colors nothing is aggressive nothing will, will kill you if something hurts you there's like in animal crossing there's a tarantula and you faint for a moment and that's a, everything is fine like there is no no like in a, well, yes. Uh, in a, in a, that's an idea that uh, you know that's the popularity of these games kind of comes to answer to to our needs right now, right? Like we don't want to be the one hero that saves the world. Sometimes yes, but mostly the world is so unstable right now that it's so nice to look to something that is giving you stability, that is giving you the the security, and it's like that's that's the appeal of cozy games, the the, the safety on a ludic level. Nothing will kill me, nothing will hit me. There is no time that will run out. But also on this, it's relatable. It is nice. It is like I have my own village or farm or whatever. I can go, I can grow my, you know, everything is, is going to be nice. And the thing that comes into play here is the abundance, which is such an interesting aspect because we, we, when we talk about cozy games, the abundance is one of those tenants that, that are being listed and, and not questioned. Um, we, we can understand it in a sense, abundance of resources, right? Because in, for example, survival game, like Don't Starve, the idea is that you have to look for resources. You don't have things. You might run out of things and so on. Uh, so, so in these games, you usually have all these resources. Uh, fruit bus being, I think, also another thing that I found uh, while well, you know, looking for it, and it looks so adorable that I'm showing with you so we all can check if it's you know as nice as <laughs> inside as it is but it looks great but it's also one of those you know you make food uh, so you have all, all the ingredients that you need you you know you prepare it uh, there might be a little bit of this aspect that you have to you know hurry up and and, and get that to, to to customers but that's not you know, really really that bad uh, in the good pizza great pizza uh, you make pizzas and the difficulty is that you sometimes have to guess what what they meant when they said that they you know, don't like spicy things but want something because the orders are not as straightforward as you would normally like. But you, as you can see, you always have uh, all the ingredients are there. You're not never running out of ingredients, they are there. Uh, and in general, all these all this, uh, um, time management things. Uh, also, you will, you will probably have to go and buy and kind of remember about it, but you will have it. 
And that is kind of bringing me to the idea that, because we talk about abundance often, like I said, ver, you know, cozy games versus survival games, for example. But the question is like, is it really lack is of abundance in games like Don't Starve? Okay, we have to look for, 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 for food, for resources. But at the same time, we kind of do know that they're gonna be there. And this is not how real life's definition of you know, scarcity would be. Uh, because scarcity would normally be, I cannot find it, I cannot afford it, I don't have it, I am actually gonna you know, starve. And in games, we do have that safety all because we expect games to be fair. And right? the games will be, might be more difficult, but if I follow these five rules and go to the places where the carrots usually grow at midnight, they will be there, right? So, so there is, I don't, I think that there, there needs to be more nuance to the understanding of abundance in this sense, because we cannot really say that these games are survival games or, or horror games or whatever. There is less things, you have to look for them, but they are still there, they are relatable. And that is also a lot of safety that we do not have in, in, in here, right? In this, in this plane of existence. So that brings me to, uh, almost last point, um, of, yeah, so, so the other element that this can be juxtaposed with is food wastefulness. And this is, think about uh, the example of Dishonored and preferably of Bioshock, where, I don't know, two, two, two interesting things about these games that, uh, or, or generally the action games, the mainstream games, that have you, uh, have food as a restorative, right? So you can, if I'm running out of health, there will be food, I will eat food, I will get my health back. Usually, because in, in Bioshock you also have tonics and you can also take tonics and they will restore more of your health. They will, you have to pay for them. Usually food is free. These are better. Food is a kind of last, you know, little bit. And this is a lot of what these games do, that they put, we come back to the taking food for granted. That, uh, I'm gonna be two memes of, uh, begging and singing for food, barrels and trash cans filled with cake and sandwiches, because usually in Bioshock you take food from trash cans, but this is like a pristine, amazing, you know, entirety of it. And uh, not feeling too well, better eat the sandwich I found on this dead guy, which is the reality of games. Um, uh, I mean, literally. Um, and that's such an interesting thing, because that's when I realized it for the first time, it's literally, again, this question, like I promised at the end, what does it tell us about what we actually think about food? Because in these games, food, again, cheap or extremely, um, uh, or free or extremely cheap, um, not as good and powerful as, you know, medicine, tonics, magic, whatever. Uh, but definitely that means that it's everywhere and it is available and this is, and we are taking it for granted. And here I want to apply the um, idea by Wondersee and Schussler, but with no German accents pronounced correctly, probably. <laughs> so yes, uh, they were talking about uh, plant bl plant blindness. I am not a fan of using blindness because you know this is a more marginalizing um, um, language. Using you know the the, the um, uh, disability to to talk about something metaphorically, not ideally. Um, maybe ignorance would be better or something still worshiping it if you have a good word for uh, t taking for grandness but one you know one word uh, i will take it but they were talking about plants and plant bl blindness as the inability to see or notice the plants in one's environment the inability to recognize the importance of plants in the biosphere and in human affairs the inability to appreciate the aesthetic and unique biological features of the life forms that belong to uh plant kingdom and the misguided anthropocentric ranking of plants as inferior to animals and thus as unworthy of consideration. And that strikes very, very close to what I've just been talking about, right? So we, it kind of feels to me like there is this uh, food taking this for granted, for granted, yeah, um, or, or ignorance or, or whatever we want to call it. Because food in games, there are so many really good food games or cooking games, and they do so many interesting things now. But all of them kind of have this thing still that food is uh, taken for granted. Like there is uh, very interestingly that, my last slide, I'm almost finishing, so that uh, when I was actually putting that, I thought also, you know, Fruit Ninja, very good example of wasting food uh, for, for, for fun. But uh, yeah, so, so the, the, the kind of ending thought here is that um, a lot of games are <laughs> putting the, the food as something that we have, that we can rely on, that we definitely 
uh, yeah, that we take for granted and can take for granted. Um, very interesting in games, there's an absence of discussion on hunger. Games are very good now on talking on marginalized identities or oppression or depression or uh, write a lot of games about, about grief or, or we, we, we are learning, games can talk about difficult, difficult issues and they often do, but somehow not about hunger. Ver that even is seen in how very few, and I think I literally know like three or four uh, games about eating disorders. There are also not that many games on eating disorders. So like there is an interesting thing that I'm not sure where it comes from, but there is a, a problem of coming, lack of talking about, uh, you know, food. I don't have my own cat, so uh, uh, cat from Stray will have to do it. Thank you very much for listening to that. Okay.